to anyone. But oh well. Uh, okay, so there's a couple concepts about beam bending that I wanted to clar clarify from the last couple times. So the first day we talked about it, I had mentioned so the that Euler beam assumption that plane uh, plane sections remain plane after deformation, uh, whether that increases or decreases the stiffness, I feel like didn't quite stick. So I brought um, a, stick, a stack of post-it notes. Uh, now, if I, if I take this stack of post-it notes and I bend it, you can see the ends of the post-it notes. This is completely disconnected. Don't follow the normal section at all. So now this is staying totally vertical, whereas the, the neutral plane is going down at some angle, so they aren't staying perpendicular to each other. On the glued side, it does a little bit better job. Um, so you can see it kind of follows the, the curvature a bit, but it still wants to shift. So, uh, so it still doesn't quite stay normal to the plane, or stay normal to the neutral axis. So what I'm, well, the assumption that I'm making with Euler beam theory is that, say, I have a very slender beam, so something now that was only a couple sheets of paper thick, and I bent it, I can assume that those normal planes stay normal with this one. And because that Euler beam assumption takes that all of them stay normal, what I'm effectively doing numerically is stretching the top and compressing the bottom a little bit more than it would be experimentally. So that means I'm over, uh, it, it's gonna over predict how stiff my response is going to be. Um, so that hopefully it's a little bit clearer demonstration of that idea. Uh, this is clearly exaggerated too because uh, this is paper and there's no shear stiffness between the sheets of paper because they're not connected. Uh, but real materials kind of do the same thing. So really it, it doesn't want to stay perfectly normal to the plane. It wants to deform a little bit. And so other theories like Timoshenko beam theory can accommodate that a bit. Uh, the other big assumption to remember is we're doing small strain. So all of these deflections are teeny, teeny, tiny. Uh, there we go. So we're not actually deforming this thing a lot. Uh, and under that small strain assumption, it's also reasonable to expect that those plane sections remain plane and all of these Euler beam theory uh, constants hold up. Okay, yeah. So basically, in a long slender beam, the shear deformation plays a much smaller relative role. And so ignoring that in the long slender beam is OK. Yep. But it does check slightly like make our answer off from what you find experimentally. Yes, okay. exactly. So it's a useful assumption because, well, it's generally close enough, which for engineers, that's what we're aiming for. Yeah. Is it useful? Um, yeah. And then it's a uh, very simple theory to implement. Mm -hmm. So that's numerically and experimentally, analytically, it's all, or numerically and analytically, it's very easy to kind of plug in Euler equations and do derivations for things. Um, so that's why it's been so popular still. So in general, like when you talk about the stiffness of It always kind of be like case basis, like say you have like a simple L, L bracket, you have like the force coming here, your stiffness is going to be like units per millimeter of deflection at a point. Mm -hmm. Is that similar for teams or is it like a kind of general stiffness? Yep, same idea. So now, so that stiffness, uh, what do I want to, so say for our, our cantilever beam, we have that deflection at the end point. So I'm applying some P, I'm going to get some deflection, which I can tell. There we go. Uh, I wrote that very small. Uh, but that, that delta uh, at the end point relates to the P as P L cubed over E I. I think this is 3. Yes, 3 E I. So the deflection of the end point. So the stiffness of the beam. You're relating your force to your deflection. Maybe. There we go. You're relating your force to your deflection. So you're actually taking your beam bending stiffness. Is this effective uh, stiffness based on the length and the Young's modulus and the area moment of inertia? So when people say a beam bending stiffness, it's actually kind of the culmination of all of these and the boundary conditions. It's a fuzzy definition that I don't. It, 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 it's used in practical engineering because you say, oh, I have this beam and it's this stiff. So if I apply a load to the end, I know how much it's going to deflect. So it's a very useful quantity. But 
in terms of like actual quantitative like what's going on it's a little bit more nuanced and you have to think about what's happening in the what the boundary conditions are what the length is what the cross section is of the beam yeah good question other questions on this okay uh, one clarification for uh, sign conventions so uh, before I had drawn say we have a, a cut section of a beam here I'm going to define now this so I have my coordinate system here X Z I have some Q and some moment so a uh, positive moment here is on a cut side of the beam on the the right side of the cut side of a beam this is a positive moment going downward along the direction so it's in the direction of positive z and our moment uh, I'm going to call positive moment is counterclockwise on the left side of the cut face of a beam counterclockwise as the convention that we're going to be using here I think this is generally true although I can't say for sure because I feel like I've seen it mixed up one way or the other before uh, depending on exactly where you're looking. Yeah. So does this mean that the, the top half of the beam is in compression and the bottom half is in tension with the positive moment? Uh, yes. The top half, with, with this moment, the top half would be in compression. Why do I not like this? Yeah, so if I if I drew the other side of the beam here, then I would have it going out like that. No, I would have it up like that if it was opposite, which I don't like. Scratch that. Let's maybe come back to this on Monday, because I thought I thought this through. Clearly, I have not thought this through properly. Um, so let's jump to. Uh, so the, the shear force definition that I had given you uh, is for a rectangular beam, doesn't hold for other beam cross sections. There's a way to derive it for other cross beam sections that I'm not going to talk about. I'm just going to leave you with that shear equation because uh, that's what will be useful for the lab and because we don't have time to go through a full shear derivation and other loading conditions. Uh, for the shear force at least, now in this convention, so this one I'm, I'm fine with, uh, let's take a look back at our, our three-point bent beam. So I had, I had thrown out the equations at you guys for the end deflection of the beam and the moment of the beam. So when I have this three-point bent beam with some load P on the center, what I actually have is now uh, I can say that there's there's a corresponding reaction force P over 2 here, reaction force here P over 2. So let's erase this a little bit. Um, when I have, when I'm looking at what that shear force is now, if I, so if I take a cut section of the beam here, this is now my positive x direction, this is a P over 2, I have my Q reaction force to this this Q reaction is also a P over 2. And in that sign convention, let's draw out a Q diagram here. Uh, Q, this is now also going to be positive P over 2, where X, uh, this is a positive direction, this is my negative direction. I'm just drawing things upside down to make them more confusing. Um, so, Similarly here, I have a reaction moment at this point, M, that corresponds to how far away I am. So here my moment has to balance out. If I'm a distance X away, my moment in that first section has to be PX over 2 to balance out the lever arm effectively that I'm going with. When I go further in that three-point bent beam, that, uh, I now have a P over 2 at some point, or a, I guess a P over 2 and a P there. My reaction force now, oh, why is it, this is going to be a weird lecture day. 
I guess we'll see what happens in the videos if it's also freaking out. So uh, this P over two, this P, now I actually have my force it has to be a, a negative P over two or a P over two in, the, in this direction. So there's P over two going up, P going down. So I need another, I guess I can draw it up, um, another P over two going up this way, which is the same thing as negative P over two going downward. So now when I get to that P, when I get to the midpoint of the beam, here I have this Q jumping up. And then similarly, when I get to the end of the beam, I have that last P over two and I don't need any reaction force to balance it out. So this is at my L over two where I'm applying my load. My moment now, if I went to go integrate this, so I have M, uh, P X over two on one side. So now I'm gonna draw X, my moment. I have P X over two on one side at the end here. Let's move this up. Uh, at the end here, there's a free boundary. So the moment has to be zero. Here, as I go further away, it has to balance out with that Px over 2, which is also just I integrate my shear force and I get uh, another x in there. And then when I get to that L over 2, I now have to go the opposite way. So I have a free boundary down here, and my uh, shear force is reducing with P over 2. So I, I go back down until I get to my L here. And my max happens here at the middle, and this max moment uh, is my P L over two. So that max moment is an important quantity. Knowing how this force just gets distributed in the beam is an important quantity. I now know, well, this is gonna be, no? Cool, cool, cool. This is gonna be fun. Uh, my max stress based on that beam, so based on that, Stress max is mz over i, uh, where z is the distance here from the neutral plane. So the maximum distance from the neutral plane is h over 2. My i for a rectangular beam, assuming this is a rectangle with base b and height h, is 1 12th bh cubed. If I plug all of that in, then my maximum stress is mh, no, m p. I can do the PL, there's a 12th, there's a 6 that comes up to the top, and then a B H squared that stays on the bottom. Yep, cool. So my maximum stress in the beam happens to be that. Uh, now, if I wanted to figure out the deflection, I would have to go back to those integral equations that I had wrote out. So that W, um, W, of x is my uh, c1 x cubed, c2 x squared, c3 x, c4. And I would plug in different boundary conditions. I could take a couple integrals of my moment. Uh, and this one happens to be piecewise. So my boundary conditions, I had uh, w at 0 equals 0 because of that free boundary. My moment at zero is zero, which I already had in there, but so my, my second derivative at zero is zero for one side. This is for x is less than L over two. Let's move stuff up. My w at L is equal to zero. My moment at L is equal to zero for both of these for x is greater than or equal to L over two. Uh, and then here at the center, my W at L over two from, let's call this a, a one and a two from my left and right side. My left side at L over two is equal to my right side at L over two. And my deflection, the angle at the middle is also equal. L over two is equal to the angle at L over two. So if you take all of these boundary conditions, you take a piecewise function on both of these sides. Uh, can, where did all my paper go? You take a piecewise deformation on both of those sides, you end up with some big long 
W that ends up being quadratic. So uh, this is the equation that I hadn't written out. Uh, my W of X is some big thing. So you do a whole bunch of math, plugging stuff in, you end up with PX over 48 EI, I know it disappeared, 3L squared minus 4X squared, cool, that's back, uh, on one side for X is less than L over 2, then I have P over 48 EI, uh, this is now 4X cubed minus 12LX squared plus 9 xl squared minus l cubed for x is greater than l over 2. So it's this big long kind of gross equation uh, that you end up with by plugging in these boundary conditions into that solution. Most of the time you won't see this reported at all. People don't normally care about it. What people actually care about is the maximum deflection of the beam so they can get the bending stiffness. So uh, that maximum deflection happens in the center of the beam. Uh, you can kind of tell based on symmetry. You could take a couple derivatives and also figure it out. Uh, and I can say that W max is in the center of the beam. So it's the W at L over 2. And that's PL cubed over 48 E I. So you see that now for a three-point bent beam, um, the deflection would be a lot less than that of a cantilever beam. So that boundary condition is kind of coming into play. You can sort of imagine, mm, no, I'm not going to get into that. It's The three-point bent beam is sort of like two cantilever beams stuck together, but that's more detail than we need to think about. Back up on your sigma, you had a Z, and then Z refers to, is that the midpoint? Yes. Uh, so this is, I'm going to say, for the bar. When I'm actually looking at this thing, my coordinate system technically starts here. And I'm not drawing it out properly. My z and my x. So for a beam, uh, the z now is the distance from the neutral plane, mm. where my coordinate system I'm going to define my zero as my neutral. Axis. So the maximum distance from the neutral axis I can get. If I have a beam of height h, is that h over 2? Yeah. How'd you get the sigma max with 6 pl over h squared? I don't know if the 6 is. Uh, I have, I can, there's a 1 half on the top and a 1 twelfth on the bottom. pl over 2. Did I miss something? Oh, maybe it is a 3. Send my notes wrong? I might have. Yeah. I did miss a two. Thanks. Um, so this is actually a three. Good catch. Thank you. Likewise, so I'm posting lecture notes online as, as PDFs after we go through things. If you see errors in there, please let me know. I'm sure there are bound to be some. Can I ask why maximum moment is PL over two? Uh, that's just it, it. The maximum moment happens here at the center, and yeah, and so it's uh, the equation for a moment up to that point is px over two. You can kind of think of it like if I go all the way up to that midpoint of the beam. Let's draw some more stuff over here. Yeah, I'm thinking of pl over four because you're not going the full length of the beam to get there. Oh, x is all over two. So it's PL. X is all over two. Mm. You're right. Yeah. So it's maximum at the middle. Oh, there's another two. I'm just missing twos all over the place. Thank you. So the max moment, yes, is actually PL over four. My bad. I wonder if I actually have it right in my other notes. Um, so this should be three halves. <sighs> okay. The sum of both. Sum of both. Like on either side, both forces. Um, it should be like the moment on one side and the moment on the other side. Yeah. 
it's just one moment in the middle that's acting. Yeah, so it's like the over two times over two and then it's just the I want to say no, but now I'm not entirely sure. <laughs> so I need to actually go through this again um, in a little bit more detail. Okay. Um, so for your lab uh, next week, these equations, I'll make sure they're right in the notes when I post them. Um, you'll need to know what the max stress is, what this moment distribution is, what the shear is in the body how to calculate stress from that, how to calculate um, shear or uniaxial stress and shear stress from those, and you'll need to know what this deflection is, or deflection equation is. Uh, we'll also need to know stress and strain rotations, which is what I need to get through um, by hopefully Monday, and we'll start touching on stress today. So uh, real quick, I'm going to throw some stuff at you for four-point bending, uh, and I'm just going to give you equations and really briefly talk about them just so you have them. So four point bending now, uh, I'm going to set this up, let's move this down a little bit. Uh, generally is done symmetrically, so let's say four point bending. So here I'm going to have some applied load still that I'm going to call P to the top middle part of this, which I'm going to split into two components along the beam. I'm going to have these ends also be simply supported, meaning I have a fixed and a fixed there. Uh, so I'll have a corresponding reaction force, P over 2, P over 2. I'm going to say that these act at a distance A so that Overall, my beam length, so this will be A, uh, this will be A, and this will be L minus 2A in the middle, or uh, normally I would say A, L minus A, and then L for the whole thing, which I might have just made it slightly more confusing by changing the way I was indicating things. Uh, so here we can go through a similar sort of analysis and write down what our shear is, what our moment is, and what our max deflection is. So the shear, if I were to go through this, uh, if I were to draw cut sections, I have a reaction P over 2 here, so I'm still going to be at a positive P over 2 uh, up until I hit my length, or my, my displacement A. At that point, these p over 2s actually cancel out, and I end up with a 0 p over 2. I have another one come in at that L minus A point, and then it goes back to 0. So I have a negative p over 2 there. So I have I have kind of this not sawtooth sort of function for Q. Uh, my bending moment, uh, if I went and integrated that, I would have now <laughs> nothing. This the screen is blanking out. I would have a linear uh, moment there uh, while the Q is increasing. I would have zero change in moment all the way through the mid section of this, and then a decreasing <coughs> moment to the end at L. Uh, my maximum moment here now uh, is PA over 2 in the center, A over 2, uh, which that should match up if A was, if this was a three point bending, if that A was L over two, then I would end up back at my same solution as I had for three point bending. So I'm kind of just spreading it out here. And then my deflection for this, uh, oh, and I guess here, this is, this is that same uh, PX over two slope going up and down. Um, this now, my deflection is, slightly a slightly different shape than before. You can still kind of consider it as piecewise, but it is continuous. Uh, 
So that W, I'm not actually going to, I have the, the equation for it in the notes, the piecewise equation. It's bigger and longer and grosser than the three-point bending one. So uh, I'm going to give you the maximum deflection, which happens at the midpoint is WL over 2, which is equal to PA over 48EI. Then I have a 3L squared minus 4A squared. There we go. Cool. Uh, so correspondingly, my max stress, uh, stress max, if I plug in again that MZ over I, my Z over I, let's do this, is H over 2 over BH cubed over 12, which is then 6 over BH squared. There we go. That's the 6. And then I needed that 4 in there. Uh, so my stress max then is 6P A over 2 BH squared or 3PA over BH squared. That's a little bit small. I'm going to make that bigger. So 3PA over B. There we go. Maybe slightly more legible. Cool. So uh, with these relations, uh, that'll be what you need to derive at least the stresses in the beam bending setup for three and four point bending, uh, which will be next week with aluminum bars. So questions on that before we jump to the next thing. Cool. Any more mistakes that you can catch that I've made? I'm sure there are plenty. Okay. Cool, cool. So now let's jump to talking about stress and strain. So on the first, second, second lecture, we talked about what stress was, what strain was, what engineering stress and strain were, how they were defined. But now I want to talk about it in a little bit more depth uh, and actually go through something that should still be somewhat review stress transformation, strain transformations. Um, but about that, we have to look at stress as we would in an engineering context. So this section, uh, is now going to be my in in the notes section three, which is stress, strain, and elasticity. And here I'm going to start with stress. So, the question now, I had shown you before if we have a. a a one-dimensional body and I'm applying a, a stress in that direction I get a I get what it what I would call an engineering or a true either an engineering or a true stress and engineering a true strain but what happens now if I have something a little bit more complicated so what happens if I have some random shaped body uh, which I'm gonna affectionately call my stress potato uh, and I apply some random loads all around the outside of this or E5. Uh, pretend this is in three dimensions and it's pushing on all directions. What is now, if I take a little cube of material here in the middle, what is the stress at that point? Can I call it a uniaxial stress? Can I call it a biaxial? How do I, how do I look at stress components? How do I even think about this? So it turns out there are nine different stress components that we can consider. So uh, I'm going to draw that cube now blown up a bit. Cool. Uh, I'm going to call this my X, Y, Z. Y, Z, making sure I have a right-handed coordinate system. Now, on each of these faces, I'm going to say I have a stress in each of these directions. So I'm going to draw a little mini coordinate system on each of these faces. Now along each of these faces, I'm going to say the 
direction normal to the face. I have some stress in that direction, which I'm going to designate with a double uh, suffix. So I'm going to call this my, my sigma xx going this way, sigma yy going out or going up, and uh, sigma zz going out of the plane here in the directions on the faces now. So these these you can consider as our, our uniaxial tensile stresses, except now we have it in three directions. Uh, in the other directions, these are our shear stresses. So uh, here, uh, as a notation thing, I, I'm going to use uh, xy. This is effectively the same as using a tau. Sometimes it gets used interchangeably. Um, I'll mainly be using it as a sigma xy, but um, they mean the same thing. It's just a notation thing. So along that face, I'm going to say on the face that it is and in the direction that it is, that's the shear. So my sigma xy, so this is on the x face in the y direction. Uh, now similarly, I can plot out all these other ones. This is my sigma on my x face in the z direction. This is on the z face in the y direction, on the z face in the x direction. This is on the y face in the z direction. And this one is on the y face in the x, x direction. So now I have a whole bunch of stress components all on this three dimensional body. Uh, and there's a whole, it, it, trying to think about each of these nine individually is a little bit difficult. So what we normally do uh, to make things a little bit more approachable is write this out in matrix form. So this is something I th think you should have seen before, hopefully. I feel like this is something people have gotten tripped up on in the past. So you've seen stress written out as a matrix. Cool. Anybody who hasn't? No? Haven't used it? Okay. We'll show, in this one, we'll get into a little bit of detail of how we actually use it. Here, I'm going to draw an underline for, to designate this as a stress matrix now, which um, technically is a stress tensor, which I am not going to get into the nuance of what the difference between a matrix and a tensor are, uh, but know that mathematically this is actually a tensor. So if you hear me say stress tensor, uh, don't get too worried. We're not actually going to be doing anything different with it. So now I'm going to write these all out. So I'm going to put those uniaxial stresses along my diagonal components, CZ, uh, my shear along these directions, XZ, YZ, uh, YX, y, uh, ZX, and ZY, all out in a matrix like that. Is that big enough? Is that legible? Maybe. Okay. If it's not, please let me know. Um, so now, if I want to look at a couple simple cases, so to, to relate this back to something you're hopefully familiar with, let's look at a uniaxial tension, uni uh, biaxial stress, uh, and a pure shear. So now if I have, let's say, x, y, z, and I just have some applied stress along that direction of the beam, my corresponding stress is going to be sigma and then zeros everywhere else. Because I only have stress in one direction uniaxially. So when we draw that engineering stress out, this is actually what we consider the stress as in the body, but we ignore all of the rest of that because why would we look at nine zeros or eight zeros in a thing? Uh, for biaxial stress, you can do something similar. Do, do, out. So now if I have some stress 1 and stress 2 in the x and y direction, my stress, I'm using the same coordinate system as that, uh, my stress here would be sigma 1, sigma 2, 0, and zeros everywhere else. Uh, if I have a pure shear, is a direction? it is. Thank you. I'm getting my coordinate systems mixed up on my own. 
Yes. So this would be a sigma 2 here. There's actually nothing in the y direction. Thanks. Good catch. Um, if I have a pure shear on a body, which means that I just have shear stress applied to it. So let's say I have something going along these directions and I have some shear stress tau, my stress matrix or tensor is going to look something like this. It's going to look like nothing because my screen is going to pluck out. Cool. It's going to look something like that. So uh, there's this is a whole lot of numbers in that stress tensor. Um, I don't actually, I want to see what ways I can simplify it. There's uh, something that you're probably at least familiar with, and that's the symmetry of the stress tensor. So this, it turns out this needs symmetric matrix. The way we figure that out, um, so we know that in our body we don't, we're applying some state of static stress. Uh, so we don't want those stresses or effectively forces to be moving or spinning our body. So if we do, I think I went through the derivation for this before and I don't think it was super useful, so I'm just going to tell you stuff. If I do uh, a moment balance on a body, a uh, moment balance on an infinitesimal body, and call this, uh, so if I say now that there's some shear along these directions, uh, some normal force along other directions, I have some sigma xy, sigma yx, yx, xy. I could define my coordinate system in the center here. I would have uh, minus uh, dx over 2. Uh, I'm not going to write it all out. Basically, I, I, I have an infinitesimal um, dx here and a, a similar infinitesimal dy. I would take the sum of all these bodies, so I would take a sum of, of the moments around the center point, and I would say if I don't want my body to spin, that sum of moments has to be zero, and what I end up with is that this has to be symmetric. So my sigma xy has to be equal to my sigma yx. So then that means that for all of these stress tensors, I can say that if I know what my sigma xy is, it has to be the same on my yx. And effectively, the reason for that is that I, when I apply a shear, I don't want my body to spin around. So in order to, by, based on a moment balance, my, my body's symmetric. Um, there's one other one. You can do a conservation of linear, uh, or conservation of force in the axial direction and you end up with a, a stress equilibrium on a body that I don't really want to go through because I don't think you end up actually using it. Um, but at least we have stress here. So uh, for this, so next week on Monday, we'll talk about what that, uh, how, to, how to move that stress tensor around. So now that we have this in matrix form, changing stress direction, so now this is an important concept, that stress is a constant quantity in the body. And so later on, when I, when I want to look at this in a different way, so let's say um, I actually want to change my coordinate system, and I want to rotate this around and say I'm looking at this now as a x, y, z. Uh, all of a sudden, this stress now would be in this central position. So, what I what I'm effectively doing in is is rotating my coordinate system, and in rotating my coordinate system, I can rotate my stress tensor and get out stress in new directions. So, you should have seen stress rotations in Moore's circle before, um, right? So that idea of Moore's circle, maybe we'll go through both Moore's circle and general equations for stress and strain rotations um, as a refresher. That's also what you'll need for the beam bending lab. But um, in general, what you're doing is just rotating this matrix around in space. So the stress in the body stays constant, and then the way that we look at it changes. And it turns out that's really useful because certain materials are going to fail differently depending on what direction their stress is oriented. So for example, 
Um, our brittle materials generally fail in tension, ductile materials generally fail in shear. So it's useful to know what direction the maximum shear is and what direction the maximum tension is in, because um, then we know what direction our material is going to fail. But we'll get into that next week. Uh, for the next five minutes or so, I want to talk to you really briefly about the lab next week. So we haven't posted it yet. Uh, we'll post it sometime this evening. I need to go through it with the TAs one more time to make sure everything in there makes sense. Uh, we'll also be giving you a template for this lab. So we'll give you a rough sketch of, it won't have much detail. There'll be some general notes and instructions at the top. Um, if my computer wants to turn on, come on. Uh, this is not cool. Uh, no, am I going to have to, ah, oh, jeez. I've been having issues with it, not coming out of sleep mode. Luckily, it's solid state, so it might start up in the next, like, minute or two. Yeah. Okay, but we'll give you uh, a sheet with instructions for uh, generally where, what we're expecting to see in the lab, what, uh, what we're expecting to go where in the lab. And we'll see if I can actually show you the lab manual. Oh, is that why? You're installing updates. Oh, you son of a bitch. <laughs> Come on. Are you kidding me? Um, cool. So that's probably not going to happen. Um, damn it, Windows. So. I can explain it really briefly without actually showing you pictures. The lab manual will be posted tonight. Um, the, you should take a look at it before you get to the lab. Just give it a read through, kind of understand gen generally what you'll be doing. The TAs will be there with you to set everything up. Uh, we'll be doing two experiments, a three point and a four point beam. And in that, we'll have four sets of strain gauge rosettes on the beam which I'll talk about the, the, what strain gauges are, how they work, what the theory is next week. Um, but in those strain gauge rosettes, uh, they're located on different positions along the beam. Your job will be to apply some load measure to the beam using a, a little uh, screw uh, turn buckle, which is two, two screws rotated in, or put into a thing that you twist that's screwed opposite direction so it pulls it down. Um, when you apply that displacement, you'll measure out a reaction force. From that reaction force, you'll be able to figure out what the stress in the body is. From that stress, you'll be able to figure out what the strain is, and you'll have to rotate that strain to the direction of the rosettes. So that's why we need to get through stress and strain rotations. Um, and then you'll take that theoretical value and you'll compare it to the experimental values that you're getting out of your strain gauges. Oh, it came up. Cool. I still only have like two minutes now, but let's see if I can... Hey, hey, solid state drives, awesome. This will be online. Um, so you'll have a three point bending, four point bending setup. There'll be strain gauges in different positions along the bar. You'll be measuring force here at the end. You're not saying anything? Oh, cool, Never mind. <laughs> There we go. This is the beam bending lab. Uh, take three. Uh, there's a three point and a four point bending setup. Uh, you'll have strain gauges in different positions along the beam. There'll be a load cell here at the end. Uh, and you'll have, there's some theory and equations in there. You'll have it set up where all of those strain gauges will be read, read out. You'll record the data from the strain gauges into a table here. So we give you a table for dimensions. Uh, and reaction forces, or not reaction forces, actually, yeah, reaction forces, displacement, and strain rosette readings. Um, and then you'll be calculating theoretically what those values should have been based on the reaction force and the deflection. So the point of this lab is to say, here's beam bending theory. You can calculate from beam bending theory, Euler-Bernoulli theory, what you expect your strains to be. What did you actually measure? What's the difference? Why is there a difference? What are sources of error? Is this document Uh, what you'll be turning in is the write-up. So this is the manual. So the, so the
so the write up is yeah yeah so but this is this is the lab manual itself so it's a so the the write up you'll be turning in your results analysis discussion on on what you're doing here in this lab and in a formal report you'll be doing that plus intro abstract conclusion uh, procedure, uh, kind of like a full fleshed out report. So this is just intended to be the analysis part and discussion. Uh, yes. Yeah. So we'll send out a template with what we're expecting to see where in your actual lab write up. All right. Cool. Thanks, everyone. See you next week. <laughs>